Ooh. So you want you want fees and fines established by council and administration. Can you establish all the blanks that we need to fill in with numbers? Certainly, yeah. Okay. Well, most of these are already filled in with numbers. In fact, there is. Okay. Uh, we just have to. Okay. Yeah, we had an application fee for a new tower of mm -hmm. five thousand. Uh, for any co-location or stealth um, non-tower facility, it was 2500 okay. again, to encourage that. Right. Um, so we did give discounts there. Uh, as it stands right now, I believe that an application for something like this would be $50, and you're in and out of the code office in a matter of a right. couple hours with, with no review or oversight or understanding of what's going on right. for that matter. So. One other quick question and thought about, you know, just outside the city limits made me think, is the county aware of our plans and, I mean, just as a courtesy because, uh, you know, there might be more than applications in the future just outside the city limits. And I think we have a city comprehensive plan, but we also have an Athens County land use plan. Well, that uh, points to the, um, how does the subdivision regulations with the three-mile limit um, apply to this? You know, I've, I've never, I haven't seen anything, in any case history at the, at the state level to say how that would apply. Um, unless you're subdividing land out three miles outside within a three-mile ring, ring around the city of Athens, um, I don't believe we would have any authority over it. Um, if, you, if you have to split land for some reason, mm -hmm. um, create an easement of access or something like that, then, then, we, then the city may have, may have some authority over it. Whether that would mean they have to come into compliance with all of these aspects, I really don't know. I, without seeing any court cases to yeah, say okay. how they're giving any guidance, I, have, I really have no clue. Well, maybe what we should do is uh, look at at, code, at l potential language with that, ask Pat to look at that. Because, um, sure. I mean, potentially we could just be surrounded on our <laughs> city limits, kind of like with the billboards. Um, so, I mean, I much prefer to put the three-mile limit in and test it than not put the three-mile limit in and let it go. I just so think it raises such a greater issue in terms of, you know, if they're annexed and they're in the city and, and you know, mm -hmm. paying their property taxes, the minute you go outside that, you're trying to exercise authority over their land. And, you know, three miles out, we have a lot of farmland. And right. But, I mean, there's, it doesn't mean necessarily that it doesn't, it's that we have some kind of say over it. Because there is an issue of it being right on, it may go out three miles, but it may be, Plus one foot. Yeah. And you know, you just speak to the county's comprehensive land use plan, of which the Z word was completely removed from even being recommended or mentioned or what have you. So I don't think there's a lot of teeth in it. It is a good plan uh, that was worked diligently upon, but it was only. I would point out that uh, the majority of the towers you see from the city are actually outside the city limits. Yes. This falls in the same areas as view sheds that were discussed during the comprehensive plan, which we have really no control of. Subdivision rights have to do with subdivisions parceling out roads that are built. But in terms of view shed, uh, most of the towers you see are outside the city limits. We have a scattering of them uh, that are inside, but the majority of them are on the ridge tops, I say 900 feet elevation, mm -hmm. and uh, we have no control over it. And again, then do we send the police out to do this or, or call the sheriff up and say, please enforce Well, I rights? think that if they have to go through the um, subdivision process, that this is something that can be reviewed. Mm. It probably would be a, a, we'd have to take a look at how we're interpreting the subdivision regulations. <laughs> and it would be a very strict interpretation to make that work. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily have a problem with that, but, you know, <laughs> So, I mean, that's something that, that is more of an administrative issue to be addressed later than something that needs to be put into this particular ordinance. I think we need to move forward with this ordinance as a, um, have we discussed, and, and Paul will take our recommendations and put it into um, wordage and um, get back to us, and then I will bring this up at council. So. 
Any more last Soon. comments? Soon. Soon. <laughs> Okay. Well, thank you, Paul, for all your work. I think this looks great. I think it looks very forward thinking. I'd thank like you. to get a saguaro cactus in our nets. <laughs> that would be great. So, it's my pleasure. Yep. Thank you. Hope I didn't take up too much of Council's time. Mm -hmm. Listen. No, I think this is an important issue. Um, the next uh, issue on the agenda for planning development is um, the Business Code Editions, Chapter 11 for Sweepstakes Internet Cafe. Um, we worked on this. This is kind of a, a housekeeping um, addition to our agenda from last year. We worked on the zoning code for Internet and Sweepstakes Cafe. We changed the zoning code for it. And this is the business code um, changes that we needed to go along with the zoning code changes. Um, and this is basically changing the business code, Chapter 11, to include 11.10 um, sweepstakes and internet cafe changes. Basically what it's doing is um, putting definitions, purpose, and um, applicable, purpose, definitions, and basically it's um, addressing the issue that internet cafes, sweepstake cafes, are a new type of business, so um, we need to update our business code. Um, there's license application requirements, um, discussion about location, license and transfer of the business, and this has more to do with licensing than anything else. Um, and a section about revocation and hearing procedures about the license for having an internet cafe or um, a sweepstakes cafe. And it has a whole section on um, definitions that go along with this. So it's more um, housekeeping. It doesn't have anything to do with zoning code. So it didn't come out of the planning commission. This is just kind of upkeeping. It so complements the zoning code for It complements, and that kind of fell through the the sieve of working through last year. I think at that time there was discussion that the state was going to be doing some legislation right. on this statewide, so. so we were holding off. But as far as I know, it hasn't moved forward. So we went forward with it. So. I do have a question because this, the uh, Sunday Dispatch did have an article about DeWine has had legislation pending since April about limiting the number of sweepsticks cafes. and. My only question is where we are with our regulations right now and how this would be affected by the state um, law if that is passed. Do we, you know, are we at odds with our, you know, particular legislation? Because it would let cities and townships ban internet sweepstakes cafes, <coughs> the state I, legislation. I think that if, if the state starts to let cities and towns ban things like that, then we could update our code. Okay. Um, however, at, as present um, conditions are and present ORC conditions are, because who knows when the legislature yeah, will take up pending. something like this. So I think we should go forward with this to make our okay. licensing as strong as possible. And then if something comes out, also, you know, if the ORC says that they're banned or you can ban them, then it's a relatively easy thing to update our, our code. Okay. So. Thanks for the clarification. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? So I'll bring this forward next Monday. Um, miscellaneous. Miscellaneous? Um, I, revocable licenses, you've got some revocable license to work through, I think, um, in the future. Now is one of the, the great things that the Planning Development Commission gets to do, is, as the new members um, may not know, is that we are in charge of all the revocable licenses for everything from signs to fences on easements that are within the city. Um, sometimes they're mostly 10-year revocable licenses. They come up periodically, so we will get those and they go through a process of a reading. Um, they go through a permit process with the code enforcement office and then they go through a reading. Um, these are ones that are already um, established, so there is more of a renewal process. Okay. Are these the kind of licenses like the, the bagel buggy? No, no these are, are like signage. In the signage. Right signage. Fences uh, we've had in the past, signs. 
uh, things. Utilities and right away. An yeah. example, closer would be like the uh, the Dairy Barn sign that's mm -hmm. on Richland, mm -hmm. which right. is in the city right away. Um, Bank signs. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you'll realize through this process how much right away the city actually has. So. So, any other miscellaneous? We'll get to, I haven't gotten those tonight, so okay. we will get them two yes, weeks from today. I wasn't sure what your time frame was. Yeah. So, I will work with Debbie, and maybe we can do them all, you know, kind of get them in a, in a packet so that it can be very efficient for people. Three have so. been submitted. We need two others, and we'll get those two. Yep. So, um, so, Jeff, you had a miscellaneous? Yes. Um, Thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, present this. Um, this has been, uh, last week was quite a week for me. I'm one of the uh, new people on the uh, on council and um, got to see some great examples of how the city's working. Andy Stone had a great uh, public meeting down at uh, the Ohio University Inn. We got to talk about the Richland Avenue uh, uh, project to upgrade the that road and Talk with various stakeholders and business owners and things. And that was that was a great eye opener there. You got to ride in the fire truck. And I got to ride in the fire truck. I said uh, that was the uh, that's been the height of uh, council so far. I got to uh, uh, take a ride on the brand new uh, ladder, uh, super duper million dollar fire truck, and it is it's phenomenal. I mean, it's, uh, there's just nothing like riding 14 feet above the highway and just looking down at everybody knowing that you could probably run over them and wouldn't even know it. Uh, uh, but what, was, uh, what really impressed me about that machine was the fact they could go, we went through the roundabout and it was incredibly smooth. You didn't even know, you weren't thrown to the side, it was just, it's, it's fantastic. And I really, really got a kick. The roundabout's fantastic. Yeah, that too, yes. I enjoy the roundabout. And. Um, so, um, I have a resolution here that I'd like to introduce to council next week. For, and being new uh, to council, I really don't know what all the procedures are. And there, as far as I can tell, there's no handbook to, to guide new council members. So I'm just sort of you know, flailing my way through. So if I sort of violate a protocol or uh, made a misstep, I apologize now and in the advan in advance because I'll probably do it again. Um, <laughs> I'm a slow learner. But um, what I have here is something that is um, not directly concerned with the city, per se, but it has to do with the fact that uh, Athens is uh, an elected democracy. Everyone that's sitting up here uh, has went through an election, and that's why we're here. The mayor's been through an election. There's other city officials who are elected. and. That, uh, that great freedom that we have to be elected to, to a public office, I believe, is, is seriously threatened now. And uh, to make a statement about that threat and how serious it is uh, to democracy in general and, and to Athens in particular, I've uh, met with uh, a group of people and done a lot of research about the possibility of uh, passing a resolution, non-binding, it's not an ordinance, so it doesn't require three readings. And it's the kind of uh, resolution that the city is sort of noted for, making a statement about something that is of a social or um, a governmental concern uh, to the people. And we've done that, for example, with uh, the registration of, of partners. Uh, the city doesn't have a law that recognizes, say, a, a gay marriage, but partners can can register. And that's a statement. It's non-binding. It's not a law, but nonetheless, it's there. And I think the city is respected for that. So after uh, going through uh, several versions of a, of a draft here, which I passed out to council, and I have other copies for anyone who would like to have one. Um, the title is a resolution in support of abolishing corporation constitutional rights and create a truly representative democracy. What's happened for the past 150 years has been a, 
a gradual erosion of human rights and the advancement of non-human corporation rights. And I think that needs to be redressed. It needs to stop. I uh, was notified by my campaign treasurer when I was, uh, uh, after I was elected, that I had to file a report to the Ohio State Election Commission about how much I had spent and to list all my contributors and to make everything legal to see where the money was coming from. And um, I spent 79 bucks. And I had no corporation donations whatsoever. It's not that uh, I wasn't approached, it's just that I didn't want them. I paid everything out of my own pocket. Well, those uh, days, I'm afraid, are very, are over. Uh, today, a corporation, because of certain uh, Supreme Court decisions, particularly the one in 2010, uh, Citizens United versus the uh, uh, Federal Elections Committee uh, Commission uh, states that a um, corporation has the, fr the rights of a human being to donate as much money as they possibly can to a campaign because that is guaranteed by the First Amendment. Um, and that is just wrong. Corporations are not human beings. People are human beings. People have rights. Corporations shouldn't. So that's why I'm presenting this uh, uh, resolution. There are, um, I reduced it down to one page. There are 12 whereases. Uh, I don't want to go into all of them because we're pushing, it's 8.30. Um, I've sent out copies of this to uh, council members before by email. I hope they've been looking at them and to other people. Um, but that's where I'm coming from on this, and I'm hoping that I'll get unanimous support. Uh, there's a lot of community members who are very interested in seeing this pass, and I think um, the community support will, is definitely in favor of this. Uh, it's something that his time has come. If uh, Athens has the foresight to, to pass this, I think we would probably be the first city in the state to pass such a resolution, but we would not be the first city in the United States to do it. Los Angeles has beat us out. Uh, they came in as number four. Uh, Los Angeles, population five million. I think they know what they're doing. Um, even though we are a smaller community, I think we could do well to uh, pass a similar resolution. And uh, that's what I have. And any questions about it or discussion? Well, the reason I've submitted it to this committee is uh, on the advice of our president, Jim Sands. He said that was a proper procedure to do, and that's what I've done, and hopefully I've done the correct thing. So, thank you, Mr. President. Council members, questions, concerns? Uh, just, I, I would like to note that I've received uh, communication from several citizens in the city um, about their sharing their support for this resolution and that they are interested in it. And I've also talked to several other uh, residents in person about this who are very supportive of it. Other council members? Yeah. Uh, yeah, just to say that I fully support this. Uh, I've heard from a number of citizens over several months uh, about this issue. Excellent. Um, corporations are nothing but a corrupting influence on our politics, and anything we can do to help add weight to the voice to, to end that is... It's going to be good for, for residents and for the city. I agree. Okay. Um, this will be <coughs> introduced um, next week. Next week. At a regular council meeting. Mm -hmm. um, and the law director has said this is just a Yes, I've uh, sent a copy to uh, Law Director Lang, and he's replied and said he saw nothing wrong with it, uh, being a resolution, not an ordinance. One, okay. He had no objection. So it will be up for affirmation. Affirmation. Um, next week. Okay. Um, we don't really have um, a, a place for for um, community discussion, audience discussion, um, but I think that as members have, have mentioned, we've heard from from citizens. Um, recently and so um, 
I think we've had those discussions. Um, next week, there will be discussion, uh, mm -hmm. opportunity for citizens to speak um, um, with each issue that comes up for, for a vote. So that's where we are with this. Okay, Member Fall, um, anything that's else? the end of miscellaneous for planning development. Okay, um, which leaves us with the Finance and Personnel Committee. Uh, Councilmember Nisley. Thank you, Mr. President. I have three items tonight under the miscellaneous category, and I have distributed to council members a copy of the 2012 debt due dates. That's our first agenda item for discussion. Um, at the time that we uh, made the improvements to the community center with perfection engineering and this was for energy savings at the community center we uh, did procure a, a note for three hundred thousand dollars that has accrued interest of twenty one hundred dollars we have a payment due on march 8th in order for us to have the legislation move through in time we need to begin discussing that now um, and our recommendation is to begin to pay down that note. We borrowed the money, we need to pay it back. Um, and we uh, have been in communication with the auditor's office, and I believe that the recommendation at this point, based on the balance of funds available, is to pay back $20,000 of this this year. Um, and if you want to look at the d debt due dates, this is line four that says community center energy the GO bonds, that's a $300,000, and you can see the due date of March 12th. And so that would be our recommendation at this point. I believe uh, we're also going to pay the interest. Okay. I think we're required to do that. Okay. Um, around $2,000. Mm -hmm. for that. Okay. Uh, I have a question on yes. that. Um, yes, Councilman. Maybe Council. not for you, maybe for the administration. These energy improvements were designed to um, save a pretty substantial amount of uh, cost to the city in terms of our energy use, and the community center is one of our most intense uh, buildings for energy use. Do we have any accounting yet of changes in energy use there? Um, we're still, they're still tweaking the system. It's not completely done yet, and as Rich identified, it will take a full 12 months before you begin to see the heating and cooling. And, so. and that is the biggest um, component that we did. So. Mm -hmm. okay. That, that'll be helpful to have that information. Yes. And when did that cycle begin? Well, last year, but the, if we've done different components. The most recent is the very large fan and the exercise. <laughs> um, so, and, you know, we, we put in the new um, toilet system and what have you, then there was some tweaking with those, and they're still getting some controls done for the lighting. And, you know, so. So some idea then as to when the 12-month clock starts. Well, I would when say by November we should have a full year, mm -hmm. uh, maybe December. We've been adding on, so it's been changing yeah. our way of class. So getting a, a nice hard number has been difficult. Again, we're not we're not even done with all the improvements. Um, so it would take a full year to, to, to look at that. Uh, I think the return on investment for phase one of the perfection group was eight years. Uh, so we, but that covers all the other facilities we're talking about. We, we haven't even gotten everything done with the parking garage at this point. I think everything's done at the code office, I believe, mm -hmm. and the city building, which were the two of the minor ones. Very minor. Uh, so there, there's a whole spectrum of four, like four hundred thousand dollars worth of work, I think, was. Um, actually, you reminded me. We actually had the change order for the very large span in the exercise studio and have to come back to modify what was authorized because that exceeded um, that. So there'll be a whole ordinance draft that Debbie will put together real nicely for us. So. Which was agenda item number two. Oh, so thank you very much. It <laughs> 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 takes care of me, of that item at least. It takes a, a village sometimes. <laughs> Um, okay, and then the third thing are that we have budget items from the auditor's office, and these, uh, some of the revisions um, that the auditor will identify for us are based on now our, our end of the year um, accounting on how much money we had left over, we based our budget on a certain amount, and now we're doing some of those uh, uh, 
edits to our budget. It's a working document, so. Yes, actually out of 55 or 60 funds, we only have about three that need to be adjusted. Um, one of them, Member um, Butler addressed at the beginning of the meeting as far as the issue one grant and how much money we need to put in there. Um, although we have an expense budget in place for the city, um, council's done that. Uh, the uh, estimated resources are done by the auditor's office and we have not um, finished those yet. Hopefully we'll have those done this week or by Monday um, <coughs> and uh, get those filed with the county budget commission. But um, in this process, we have these three funds. And so, as I said, one of them has been addressed. And we will estimate that um, $320,000 in grant money into a revenue budget. The other two are fairly minor in my mind. The house arrest fund, the budget shows uh, $3,000, but it's a very small, I'm guessing, um, fine or assessment run fund for court that, um, only spent you know less than two hundred dollars last year, and there's three thousand dollars in there at their expense. But we're not expecting there to be enough revenue to cover that. I'd like to reduce that to a thousand. Yeah, realistic. Yes, and so that's just um, that's a small one. And then the cap one, um, the budget is five hundred thousand um, dollars. Needs to be reduced to three hundred thousand dollars. We had more money in there last year and used our six hundred thousand. Um, for the fire truck, and um, so we just don't need that big of a, um, a budget for this year. So if we brought that down to um, three thousand, that would be three hundred three hundred thousand. Sorry, and, and cap funds are capital improvement funds, correct? Okay. okay. Yeah. And General so capital improvement. Nothing specific. Right. Not any specific. Any capital improvement in the city falls under that. Well, um, not necessarily. Actually, that is um, tax money. Two percent of our of the income tax revenue goes into that, and it can be used for any capital improvements in the city. However, as you know, the street fund and community center uh, larger funds often pay their own capital expenses. So yes, it can be used for anywhere in the city because it is tax money. But a lot of funds do use their own money from other resources to, to pay for capital purchases or projects. Um, so we had been saving a lot of money in there and, and um, appropriated a, a more last year because we had the money in there, but now we've used that. And we don't expect the revenue to come in to match that. And so right now, I don't know if the mayor has something in mind for that money, but it's uh, a good idea to have, it, have an appropriation just like all the other funds, so if something comes up that they need to major repair or replacement somewhere. Mm -hmm. So those are those three budget reductions. And um, I have only one other very quick thing to mention. Um, prior year bills, uh, if, uh, if a department needs to pay a prior year bill with uh, current year funds, if it's over $3,000, um, council has to approve it. So um, it's very easy to overlook a bill at the end of the year that you forgot was going to be coming in in January. A lot of bills do, and the department heads are good at budgeting. You know, gas, electric, phone bills, all of those come in January for the end of December. However, um, bills do get missed. And so um, just to let you know, there might be a, a prior year bill over 3000 that needs to be approved. I don't know for sure just yet. But I uh, just wanted to warn you that that is why we would be bringing that forward. If it's anything under that, we can go ahead and pay it. So you won't know. Any other miscellaneous items for finance or personnel? Okay. No. Mary, did you have something? Oh, just that something always breaks or we need to pay money. And so that's what we're debating over here. Um, the, the, there's a backup generator in the law administration building that um, is being repaired right now. Um, and we're not sure what the cost would be, just to let you know that it may come to be more than less. Mm -hmm. um, it's a 20, it's a back, again, a backup generator for the building. So when power goes off, the police can still function. Um, I guess it's it's down for the count right now, and they're looking at repairing it, but we don't know what the cost would be because uh, 
Uh, it's a 20-year-old generator. Uh, it's a very large one, I'm told. Nobody really has a price on it, but I just want to let you be aware of it. There's a repair operation and a discussion going on right now. I think that covers it. Okay. I don't know. I, 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 they were throwing numbers at me that look very large, but the idea is if you get repair, it's much better than replacing it, especially since, since I think it's on so, the third floor or something like that. Yeah. That's all. Okay. Thank you. Um, so we are going to adjourn at 8.44. We will have a regular meeting starting at 7.30 next Monday. All the stuff we talked about. change on our agenda for this evening. We will not be beginning the evening with fair housing training. That will be rescheduled for <clears throat> two weeks from tonight at, uh, on, on January 23rd, which will also be committee meeting night. So tonight we have an agenda with City and Safety Services Committee, the Transportation Committee, Planning and Development Committee, and Finance and Personnel. Um, let me just say before we begin with the cities and city services, um, we are not, uh, we are probably not broadcasting live at this moment. We are, we are, okay, the problem is fixed. <laughs> Never mind, <laughs> forget um, So, without further ado, city and safety services uh, committee. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. Um, earlier this, well, I guess it was last week, um, Member Nisley and I met with uh, the City Service Sa Safety Director and Andy Stone to discuss some of the upgrades and work to be completed on North Court Street, specifically the North Court Street Infrastructure Project Number 259. This uh, particular project has been uh, awarded a State Issue 1 grant which is for a max of 320,000. The city is looking at contributing uh, 112,000, both in cash as well as some of our in-kind. And uh, typically in projects like this in the past, the in-kind will come from our efforts to redo the, the bricks ourselves with uh, city crew workers and volunteers. Um, first reading, i uh, see here on the ordinance on January 16th does the following. So we're looking at appropriating um, 56,000 from fund 755, which is stormwater, and then 56,000 from fund 220, which is the street fund. Um, specifically, um, we're looking at authorizing the city service safety director to uh, advertise, accept bids, sign contracts, and um, when necessary to expend up to the 432,000 um, for design, construction, and construction engineering of this project. Chairman Butler, could you explain maybe to the audience what this project entails? Well, and I may also uh, uh, ask for the uh, City Service Safety Director as well, too, to, uh, and, and Member Nisley, too, who was present at the meeting, to, uh, to assist in that discussion, if there's any thoughts on that. Project on this uh, item number one. Oh, this is for the storm sewer. Right. Yep, and the replacement of the bricks. Correct. Mm -hmm. Well, the sandstone specifically, the sandstone is the big part of the project too. It's a it's a very old infrastructure which is underneath the street, um, which is in terrible need of uh, replacement. Um, that's underneath Court Street, underneath Court Street in the vicinity of Fern Street. Uh, additionally, we're looking at 375 feet of stone line. Uh, which needs to be replaced. Um, then included in this will be the rebricking of the project uh, of North Court Street, the very, very most northern end of, of North Court. Uh, I think at the moment it has uh, a, a quick brickwork got put down. Um, there's been concerns, complaints from 
uh, people that it's, it's not as smooth as other, other brick projects we've completed in the city. Um, that will all be taken up and replaced with this particular project. That, that's correct. Um, and then lastly, this project, uh, part of the, the, the bigger piece of um, uh, the, the vision of the efforts here will also include some sidewalk repair in the near, near vicinity. And I do have the listing of the streets for the sidewalk okay. repair, and that's going to be improvements to North Court, the Grosvenor, Franklin, East State Street between Carpenter and Morris, and then Morris Avenue as well, sections of that. Thank you. And the final yes. piece is due to the sidewalk repair that in April approximately we'll ask for the uh, resolution of necessity to go through the process for assessing uh, property owners for the sidewalk repairs. And they always have the choice to repair on their own. Which, which was similar to something that the city did on Carpenter in the mm -hmm. past as, as well as Mill Street in looking at sidewalk repair efforts. Sidewalk repair process is rather lengthy. Is that going to keep the? Is it split into several phases, or is that going to keep the um, North Court Street s stormwater process from being initiated? Um, do you see what I'm saying? I think we're all within our time frames okay. uh, for that resolution of necessity to be in place prior to construction beginning after July one. Or okay. That time frame. Because it is a process. So. Yeah, we wouldn't want to start to wrap the schools out, so. Oh, the kids are used to walking through giant holes. They love it. <laughs> okay. We'll keep that in mind. Yes. They get out of their way. Especially if they're full of water. Yes. It's cold, yeah. And about, is there anything else? Um, not on that particular uh, project. There is a couple of uh, miscellaneous. Okay, go ahead. This is the time, huh? This is the time. Dramatic pause. Um, so the next two items in include uh, not glamorous stuff, but things that nonetheless need to be completed. Uh, specifically, water line replacement project number 264. Um, the city, again, has been awarded access to a low interest loan of up to 990000 from the Ohio EPA Water Supply Revolving Loan Fund. Uh, my understanding here is that there, again, is uh, some efforts to um, move forward with replacement portions on West Union, Joneswood, Riverview, Terrace, McGuffey, Harris, Ransom, and Woodside with design uh, underway. And my understanding at the moment is that the administration is looking at possibly breaking the project up in, into uh, three or four smaller water line projects, um, depending on the course of direction, what's best for where we're at. Is that, that correct? That's a discussion we need to have with the auditor and to, for them to look at our revenue streams and how comfortable we are either adding debt or if we do it over a three to four year period, three, $300,000, $400,000 a year. So if, if we were to, um, if we broke it down into smaller projects, is there uh, a, a guess of uh, which ones might we might tackle first here on this, or I guess we, members, or public works director Stone might have better input on that? It's difficult. I mean, we feel that they're all needed, right. um, but you know, we do have to look at the resources we have uh, and what we can do. Um, since we've had uh, some significant breaks on Union, that, and that was also scheduled for paving, and we held off on paving it in order to do the water line project, I would think that that would rise to the top. And secondly, well, I, it's hard for me to say. <laughs> there have been a lot of breaks in the east end there, too. Uh, Southside has had a history of, of uh, water line breaks, too. It's, and, and again, this is the, the benefit of having <coughs> public works director who is able to tackle street, water, all these at the same time, which is, again, beneficial for efficiency. The last, uh, any more on that? Any more? No. On, okay, and then the, the last uh, item under uh, s city and surf uh, safety is services issues is a couple of, of uh, smaller projects, not necessarily small, but um, not as large in scope. Um, 
that aren't uh, that are down the line here. Uh, one would be the um, Carriage Hill Booster Station uh, emergency repairs is something that is uh, necessary and, and potential cost of up to thirty thousand. Uh, water treatment plant and wastewater treatment plant plant uh, telemetry hardware and software upgrades. This is something that we discussed in our meeting as well um, last week. Hickory Street water line upgrade, um, approximately 40000 um, which some of that will be reimbursed through the Hickory Street PUD developer. And that, that we spent some time um, with Public Works Director Stone diagramming the different um, water lines that are in there now and that uh, project the old, as far as what's underneath the streets at the moment and then the uh, benefit of uh, getting into the project and uh, under the street and putting in uh, bigger water lines that can handle more uh, pressure and waste. Uh, lastly, the um, Water treatment plant, motor control center, arc flash safety analysis, analysis and improvement. Uh, and again, I might benefit from a little more um, input on that, but uh, approximately um, 17,000, uh, which would um, require new ca either new capital appropriations and authorization or, um, well, I'm sorry, or the um, city council um, if we exceed 25,000, the EPA, uh, EPW operating, it will be paid for by the EPW uh, operating budget. Um, these are things down the line again that uh, the uh, administration might have a little more input on as well. The last, uh, last item with the uh, need for the... The art flash safety analysis has come about as um, you know, uh, just recently in the end of, near the end of last year. There was a public work director uh, up in Gloucester that was electrocuted, and so this has kind of heightened the uh, safety issue. And so, uh, within our plans, so that's the particular water treatment plan. So they'd like to have that done. So. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> yes, and, and again, thank you for everyone. Uh, uh, as I. Uh, familiarizing myself with uh, a, a new chapter of, of uh, the city's needs with safety and, and uh, such services. So I'm getting a crash course and ex expect to learn more along the way. Thank you. Thank you. Our transportation committee. We forgot from Chairman Godley. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, we have several items tonight under transportation committee. Uh, the first is a 15-year uh, easement with the state of Ohio for a shared use path. Um, as we're getting away from the term bike path uh, so that we accommodate all uh, types of um, use on, on such a right. such a path. And this is with the Department of uh, Mental Health, uh, so it's along the Hocking River. Um, there, I believe, by Appalachian Behavioral Health Care. Mm -hmm. And I could I could show the maps, um, but they won't mean much at this point. Uh, it's I, I assume it's for existing bike path. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if I um, remember nicely uh, knows. I think it is I, for the existing okay. bike path. I, I don't recall seeing this last year. Mm -hmm. um, but I believe it's for the existing bike path and probably a, a renewal easement. Um, for the next 15 years, it will cost us a dollar uh, payable to the <laughs> treasurer of the state of Ohio. So make sure you get that check uh, to them. Um, not, really, not really much else to say about this. just allows us to install and maintain uh, pavement in, in that area. This, this is a fairly common. Yeah. I mean, we do easements like this all the time. So. Yeah. Um, if there are no questions on, on the easement. Uh, the next item is the International uh, Street Fair, which is one of my favorite events of the year, uh, coming up in May. And so we have a request for, uh, annual request uh, that we receive for a street closure. Um, maybe you weren't copied on the letter. Uh, we received a letter uh, from, um, from Let's see, uh, ISFS, um, anyway, the, the committee that sets up the International uh, Street Fair. And the date this year is May 19th from, um, goes pretty much all day as we know. Uh, the request and enclosure from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. And I can make sure that a copy of, of this letter gets to, to the mayor's office. Um, that's, as always, a Saturday. and. You know, this is really a, a unique event in the city and one we, we hope will continue um, into the future. 
again, the city council is in charge of street closures. And plenty of time to get it rolling, obviously. Right. We, we do have enough time to handle this one <laughs> without any suspension. In a normal fashion. Yeah. I appreciate that they are always they are always um, on top of it when they come before council. Which is very nice. It, it really is helpful to get notification in advance mm -hmm. for anyone that needs, or anyone that wishes to close the street, so that we have plenty of time to prepare and to, to think about whether or not it's a good good use yeah. of our and resources. And I, th I think especially this year, because um, we're going to be having the semester conversions next year, and people need to think about that and all the date changes and overlaps with things that they probably don't realize they will yeah. overlap with. Get, getting every, everything set up ahead of time. Yeah. If, if I may, Jim. Yes. Uh, it hasn't been brought to your attention, but um, the Ohio Bay Week is uh, going to be requesting a, a weekend or Saturday closure in June. That's late June, and usually. We would like to come before we request June. that mm -hmm. for the Eastern Block. So. Okay. For the, the Boogie on the Bricks uh, section or for a preview? It's earlier. separate. It'll be separate. The Ohio Bay Week is actually moving to June because of this transition and to semesters and trying not to be in conflict with the. Um, uh, what do they call it, pre-college, okay. prior to them coming. That could be a so this will be one singular year where it will be kind of a separate event, and yep. then I, I'm being told next year they'll come back together. You know, so. Great. Thank you. Um, yeah. Um, I kind of ask a question here. Absolutely. Uh, does the uh, city generate any revenue from closing the street, or does it come gratis? Um, for for some activities, uh, we, we generally try to recoup the cost for the city to close the street. I'm not sure that we have traditionally for the International Street we Fair. Do not. I don't think we have. We do not. I, 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 I'm, maybe I'm correct in if it seems like it's more of a narrow focus for closing the street than perhaps. If sometimes we do charge our cost to close the street, correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. But for some but big this, community events uh, like this, we, in this we case we're not. We, we don't do that. Yeah. Okay. Want to know. But, but we, we can always consider that in the future as, mm -hmm. as something um, for, for certain closings. Okay. Under miscellaneous, I do have several items. Um, the first is uh, safe routes to schools. Uh, this is a, a federal grant administered by the Ohio Department of Transportation um, to facilitate the city doing work that uh, encourages and increases the safety for um, elementary, middle school. Uh, students getting to and from school. Uh, this is something we've been very successful at uh, three years in a row, and we're coming up to, to year four. In the past, we've funded projects uh, such as a sidewalk on Verona, putting in uh, flashing school signs um, by the middle school and by, by East Elementary, uh, perhaps West Elementary. I'm, I don't recall seeing one down there. Um, bike oh, racks. It's on we, Central. There is one on Central yeah. there. Um, Bike racks, we did a raised intersection last year on the east side uh, to slow traffic down. Uh, and this year we'll be doing stairs by the armory uh, coming down into town and then also stairs by uh, West Elementary up from uh, the apartments be behind the uh, school there. Actually, I think out to West State. Yeah, comes out West Going down to West State Street. Parallel to uh -huh. Central, perpendicular to West State. Okay. And uh, we just, uh, I think the Board of Control just mm -hmm. awarded it to uh, one of the companies. So that should start up this winter. Great. And the third phase, of course, is the Morris, is it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right away. Okay. The Morris right away. Yeah, the bike, bike path spur, correct, yeah. on Morris. So that will be up and coming as well. Mm -hmm. um, this year, we're, we're looking to the Bike and Pedestrian Subcommittee to possibly um, consider some ideas on, on what to uh, exactly to apply for. And to they're meeting later in this month, and they're going to be discussing it uh, at their meeting. Generally, it's between 100 and 150,000. Um, I, I don't know. Maybe the service safety director knows if there's a match requirement. There hasn't been. I, I don't. Okay. I don't recall having to, to expend money for this. Um, so that, that will be. It's just sort of a FYI, and we'll need to um, authorize application to that uh, at some point. This probably this the next month or two. Um, I don't have an exact deadline here, though. Um, but probably we'll be seeing this at the next uh, regular council meeting to, to get that moving. Uh, a lot. Yeah. Um, also, sometimes for the safe out school, we also involve the schools as well for their input. So it's a it's a collaboration between you know pedestrians, neighborhoods, and school systems. And in, in the 
the first year before we applied, I, I believe we worked with the schools to get a plan, sort of a comprehensive plan on how to, to mm -hmm. go about this type, these types of um, construction or infrastructure projects. Yeah. And that's been instrumental in helping us get these each year so that we actually have a concrete plan in place that we're right. able to look to. Actually, the, the Safe House to School program um, funded our planning process. So we could really? hire an outside planner, work with all the schools, and identify um, priority projects that would go. So we've had success, and I think that, that major success is because of the um, initial um, money that they put into for this whole planning process. Yeah. They see that we are a community that values pedestrians and bicyclists, and um, that we have neighborhood schools that are very valuable to our neighborhoods. And so I think that that is one reason why we're really successful. And Andy is really good about um, applying for this grant every year. And so I know my neighborhood has loved it, because I live right next to East State Street School, the East Elementary. And it's been really incredibly valuable. And I know that more people draw it, that more people walk and are riding bicycles because of it. Well, a great success that we hope, hope will continue. Uh, any other questions or comments? I, I just, I think if I recall correctly from the, the beginning origins of us working towards the grant and working with the community as the mayor uh, commented with a, a good collaborative project, I, I think some of the efforts too with this were to deter childhood obesity. I think that was part of the, the underlying um, aspects of the grant with, with making safer pathways to the schools mm -hmm. to help encourage children and their families to be uh, walking and, and accessing the schools. I think if I recall correctly. If, if, it probably was. If it wasn't, it certainly was part of it. Yeah, <laughs> promoting health and wellness. Yeah. And Absolutely. Um, another miscellaneous item, if, if, if we're able to move on here, okay, um, is uh, the, an update on the Oxbow Bridge, uh, the Upper Richland Bridge. Uh, this project, we, we don't need any council action, but um, I met with uh, Andy Stone last week and Herman Isley, um, and we, we discussed where we are on this, and this is going to bid in February. It's a major uh, rehab of, of the Richland Bridge. Um, construction is, is set to begin hopefully in April, uh, and the bridge will possibly be closed the majority of the summer, or more likely. Oh, most likely. Most likely be closed the uh, majority of the summer, so this is going to be a major uh, inconvenience to many people in the city, um, but it's a necessary safety uh, rehabilitation of this bridge. We're expecting that um, it could be closed as early as June 11th, and there will be a pretty, probably pretty substantial incentive to have this completed by the time um, the semester starts up next year so that this is open, so the bridge is open uh, when school is in session again. So most of this will be done over the summer, we, we anticipate, and 100% uh, complete before Halloween is, is the final uh, uh, closing date of that project, we hope. And I'm not sure if there's anything that you'd like to add. No, we just can't say it enough. It will be disruptive. Uh, so. People will notice we'll uh, <laughs> when that closed road sign goes up. You know, one of the most successful things about the roundabout was the public information that Andy developed for the, the channel. And maybe we can do the same thing. That's a good idea. Suggested routes around it and yeah. progress reports. And I think I know I got a lot of feedback about that, about how to drive it and all the process that was being done on the roundabout. And, and certainly for people that commute that route during the day to, to know how long to expect uh, it to be closed. The roundabout, the roundabout was built with that same time constraint mm -hmm. built in. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it, it worked. Mm -hmm. It did. Yeah. I should probably show it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's actually a little tighter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm noticing that um, I'm Member Disney mentioned the word semesters instead of uh, quarters. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we, yeah, the window of time there is smaller because the university will be mm -hmm. starting up earlier than in the past. Yeah. So we'll, we'll see them working hard, I'm sure, near the middle of August. They'll probably out there feverishly <laughs> finishing up what they need to. Um, the, the last item I have under Transportation Committee tonight is a Circle Drive construction project. 
Um, this is a uh, second phase of this project. The first one was, it, it wasn't new construction. There was always an existing right of way and, and some underlying um, subsurface. And at, at one point it was, it was an open road, but it was essentially a complete rebuild of the upper portion of, of Circle Drive on Columbus Road. Um, that phase is complete. Phase two is the lower part uh, where there is an existing uh, pavement, of course, that's in use at the moment, uh, but was not necessarily built up to, uh, or was not built up to uh, the standards the city demands when they accept a road into um, ownership uh, as for the city. And so uh, that part of the project is requiring an additional uh, $245,000, roughly. Um, this entire project, we received 400,000 of Appalachian Regional Commission funding uh, to help construct this, this access road. Um, much of that has been expended. There's roughly another 150,000 that will be used in phase two, left over from the, from the, uh, from the first part of the project. And this will require uh, an additional $97,000 from our street rehabilitation fund uh, to finish the road. Uh, to get to get phase two completely uh, constructed, we will have um, legislation later this month to to help get this in place, and we will need to suspend on um, on part of it because we need to enter into an agreement with um, Ohio Department of Transportation mm -hmm. uh, that will allow us to to complete this work and to use that grant money uh, that we received. Uh, so that impending deadline from the Department of Transportation is uh, coming soon. So probably we'll suspend next week. Uh, that's what we'll ask for, and it will be out on Monday, a week from tonight. Yep. This is the ARC Appalachian Regional Commission Access Road Money Grant. And phase right. one covers some of it, phase two covers the other parts. It got uh, delinked because of the uh, right of way issues in terms of acquiring or being don't having right of way donated to us. So mm -hmm. some land. Yeah, if, uh, some council members may recall we had uh, last year we had some. Uh, land that a certain property owners to donate land so we could uh, have our easements for for this road um, and so probably we'll be seeing something related to accepting that property uh, also in the next few months as this is uh, completed and thank you <laughs> Paula. <laughs> um, they hope to uh, put this out to bid in May and have the construction uh, begin sometime in mid-June or early July. And so this is something we, we want to uh, get started on pretty soon and, and have completed. I, I assume construction will take, won't take take the whole summer, probably a relatively short period of time on this section. Okay. Yes, please. Well, I'm sorry, I was under miscellaneous. Uh, you may not be there. You're still there. Uh, let me ask if anyone has any questions. Feedback on Circle Drive. I think it's Columbus Circle Drive as well. Is it Columbus, Columbus Circle Drive? Columbus okay. Circle Drive. We don't have another Circle Drive. So. We have two Circle Drives within the township, one out in the plains, one up on the ridges. Okay. So this is number three. <laughs> well, that's why we, we call it Columbus, Columbus Circle. Circle. Okay. Columbus Circle Drive. Thank you. It's, it's unique. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, Ms. Lanius. Thank you. Yeah. As a former transportation committee member, uh, something that was beneficial to me that I know we'll be probably planning in the near future is um, the street tour and knowing that this is the beginning of the year um, and we do have some new council members it's something that uh, um, I just wanted to throw out there that I know I benefited from in the past and will likely be something we organize probably in the near future uh, in the early spring generally is what we've done in the past is that right? Maybe first week in April we okay. mm -hmm. gives us time to evaluate the condition of the roads the ice to melt and <coughs> You know, finish heating up the asphalt back and forth and go from there. So a few months away, but uh, nonetheless, not too far away. You, you anticipate that <laughs> coming every year, don't you? Well, I know. I think I heard the mayor was bringing donuts, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> um, is there any other miscellaneous? Yes. Uh, I just handed you, I'm sorry, this uh, legislation, ODOT work. Oh. Uh, um, yeah, I, I got this late in the day today. Um, so that means that when I when I said the Circle Drive, Columbus Circle Drive construction would be mid June, early July, I was mistaken. Um, that was this is a this is different work that needs to be done in the city. Um, this is by the state of Ohio. Uh, they need to do some rock scaling, 
uh, uh, I assume, improve the safety of Section 33 between 550 and uh, the Strauss Run overpass. Um, I think I believe on the north side. And so they need permission from the city. Part of that is within the city, um, or maybe all of it's within the city limits. <laughs> so they need permission from us to be able to uh, begin that work. Um, so it's 0.7 miles east of the 550 exit ramp. So that might be a little on the other side of, of the Strauss Run overpass. I don't I think know exactly. Yeah. I think it's basically where the rock cliffs are. Right, I right, think right, they're trying right. to reface them so they get stable. The way I understand it, correct? So they don't fall into the road. And I, I, I haven't uh, seen this before today, so I'm not sure in terms of how long that work will take. I don't think it will disrupt traffic uh, to any, any great extent. I don't think the intention is to do that. And the other thing I would say, in Ron's email, it states um, they did May, but when uh, ODOT called today, they said they want to be able to submit their bid packet in February. So there will anyway. probably be another emergency clause associated okay. with this. So we might need to rush that through yeah. to make sure they can begin their <coughs> work. Great. Mayor. Um, just informational-wise, um, we are contracting with HATCAP for our Athens bus system, just so you know that's in progress right now. Um, also, we we're looking at every upping our contract for our bus system. Uh, we'll be reviewing that later this week. Uh, the, the end of the RFP, time. and we had two contestants come forward on it. Yeah. And I will mention that we do have regular meetings of the bike and pedestrian task force, which meets this Thursday, I believe. No. It's it's next week. Next week. Actually, is. yes. The okay. 20th, Thursday, the 20th. Oh, yeah, the 19th. Okay. Yeah, 19th. Yeah. So, so you know what's going on there. Bike and Ped, and that's noon downstairs in the same building here. Right. Bike and Pedestrian Subcommittee um, next Thursday. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great. Anything else? Chairman Thomas? That's all I have tonight. That's a lot. It was a lot. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we're going to move to Planning and Development Committee. Um, Chairwoman is, um, oh, Christine, Christine okay. Cole. Of course, I knew that. Thank you, um, President. What is that? Yeah. Uh, ton tonight we have uh, a couple things on the uh, agenda. First, we have the um, wireless communication um, regulations that are being proposed. I would like to invite Paul Logo. Um, he's been working diligently for the past year, approximately, on this. Um, this came about because, as many things in the city comes about, we realize that our code is not up to stuff because somebody uh, proposes something and we go, oh, our code doesn't really apply or it doesn't really address that. And so forever playing catch up, which many, many cities do, we are now looking at the wireless city, uh, looking at cell phone towers and such. And so Paul, I, we wanted Paul here because he's the most um, mm -hmm. knowledgeable on this and he's going to give a presentation um, on, on this process and the regulations that he is suggesting that we have, um, adopt. So, Paul? One second. Here we go. Uh, good evening, City Council. Again, Paul Logue, uh, City Planner. It's nice to see all the new faces up here. I'm pleased to be the first non-elected citizen to speak to this body. Maybe, maybe the second after Paul. So, um, it's a real pleasure. Uh, again, we've been working on what are called wireless telecommunications facilities uh, for over a year. I've been working with our planning commission. Uh, I did uh, double check my slide presentation for this evening and the initial date on it to the Planning Commission was in November of 2010. Uh, so it took a while for us to really narrow down and get our scope into a ordinance that we thought was really tight uh, as well as it's extremely beneficial to the city and to our citizens. Uh, I believe each member of council should have a copy of the ordinance, is that correct? Um, uh, they, were, they, were emailed, they were emailed out to people. They've all been emailed a copy of that, okay. Uh, one basic piece of housekeeping with it. Uh, you'll notice that the entire ordinance is written, so it says Chapter 36. Um, that was really just a placeholder. Um, I wasn't sure which chapter of city code it should be assigned. Uh, the Planning Commission agreed that it should be its own standalone chapter. It should not be built into our zoning code or our subdivision regulations. It should just be a separate chapter. We have several precedents for that, our floodplain regulations, 
uh, land development. Those are both separate chapters as well as our shade tree uh, landscaping ordinance. So with that said, I, I did put together a, a uh, short presentation for the, for the uh, city council this evening, uh, just kind of outlining the basics of the plan or the basics of the ordinance, why we, why we should be doing it, uh, the benefits to the community, and some of the details of the, of the ordinance itself. Um, so as you're probably aware, when we're dealing with something like wireless telecommunications, we've got a lot of issues here. Um, the wireless industry itself expects the need for 20,000 more, more towers per year in the U.S. In the, for the immediate future. Uh, as we all know, our cell phone capabilities are expanding rapidly. Uh, the expectations for what all of us um, demand from these devices grows by the day as well. Uh, if you just look at what was popular back in 2005 versus where we are in 2012, and it's an entirely different story. Um, at the community level, we should expect our demand for these facilities to uh, be about three to four times the number of sites that we have right now. And so that brings us, why should we have an ordinance? Um, well, for one, probably goes without saying, but we all have a need for wireless coverage and capacity. Um, secondly, we have members of the community that are concerned about the proliferation of these towers. Uh, they're concerned about how they might impact their health, their safety, and the general beauty and aesthetics of our city. And currently, our city code is silent on the siting the permitting, et cetera, for wireless telecommunications facilities. And finally, again, a city planner, our comprehensive plan, recommends that we do such a thing. And that was done, our, our plan was adopted through uh, a very public process uh, with a lot of public input and was a consensus-driven document. Uh, another reason is to have an ordinance. Um, new towers are not always needed. Um, so, for example, you may, you may have a need for the coverage, uh, but there may be alternatives to actually building a tower. Uh, you, could, uh, you could build them into a church steeple, uh, a water tower on a rooftop of a tall building. Um, you also have to show um, the need for a tower. Uh, if somebody comes in with an, ap an applicant or a potential applicant and they say that they want to build a tower, we can have an ordinance that requests the applicant explain exactly why the tower is needed to, for the community itself. Uh, so you might have somebody who comes in right now and says they'd like to build a tower. We may permit that, but the benefit of that tower may actually be to people who live outside the city limits. And under the United States Code, it is an expectation that any tower built should be to the benefit of the community that it's placed in. Hmm. And as well, okay, so what can we control? Uh, we have to look to U.S. Code 473327A in order to find that. If you've never checked out the United States Code, it's, uh, if you think our code is pretty bad, take a look at that one. Um, okay, so from the United States gives us the authority um, to regulate the placement, the construction, and the modification of these facilities. Um, it also gives us a, some more guidance. We cannot un, unreasonably discriminate against providers. So we may not be able to do a contract specifically with AT&T or Verizon or one of these, or Sprint, and say that we're only going to work with, these, with those companies to give somebody an unfair advantage. Uh, we cannot prohibit the facilities as a whole. Uh, we cannot regulate the environmental effects of radio frequency emissions, provided that the tower or the facility complies with the FCC as it relates to emissions. Okay, so again, um, other things that we can control, towers built on speculation without a service provider. There are speculators out there that look for cities that have very weak ordinances. Uh, the They'll get a permit, they'll build a tower, and they'll sit there and it won't be used for years. They will just wait for a provider to have the need, then they will lease it out. So they do it on a for-profit basis, and they'll just sit around and wait. Right now, that could happen in Athens. 
Uh, for all we know, it may have already happened in Athens. Um, the applicant must verify and the determination of actual need, which I just discussed. We can regulate the location of towers, the height, the appearance, and the aesthetics. We can require co-location, and what that means is that any tower that's built, we can uh, require that it have that it be built to standards so that additional service providers can locate on the same tower. And that's a very common thing in the industry. Sounds hard to believe, but yes, AT&T and Sprint and the other providers, does Sprint even exist? <laughs> but the other providers, they do work together um, when they need to. We can regulate lighting. Uh, I believe under FCC regulations or FAA regulations, Federal Aviation Administration, lighting is only required if a tower exceeds either 100 or 150 feet. I'll have to double check our code. The, the it's 150 and 550. Yeah. Or something. Uh, so if a tower goes above, below 150, we do not have to have lighting on it by the FAA. Uh, if there is lighting needed at the base, we can regulate that. We do have sections of city code that discuss that as well. Uh, can I ask a question? Absolutely. Uh, about that point. Uh, wouldn't it make a difference if the tower was 150 feet built on a floodplain or 150 feet built on a hill? Uh, my understanding is 150 feet from its elevation. So wherever it is on at grade. Okay. Yeah. All right, and again, other things we can control, signage, screening, the structural integrity of the, of the facility, uh, the utilities as it relates to it, uh, how they're connected. So that would be electric, uh, gas, anything that might be needed. Site security, so we can require fencing, proper screening. Um, we can have, uh, make sure that we've got sufficient easements of access for public, public emergency, for police, fire, sheriff's deputies, anybody like that. We can require a removal bond. So if these towers go up, but if we don't have anything that says how they come down, if it's no longer needed, we might be stuck with a tower for years, if not decades, uh, or generations that just sits um, that just sits in our community. Uh, so this ordinance builds in a removal bond for any abandoned towers. Uh, we can mandate or require that uh, the uh, applicant provide insurance for injuries or a falling tower or anything of that nature that might occur. And like I said, indemnification for use of municipally owned property. Uh, we can require or recommend that um, towers be built or located on city property. Um, at that point, we could be leasing that land or that location um, to add to the city's bottom line. And we can also control inspections. We can require annual inspections or biannual inspections from independent agents. And here's a few misconceptions about towers. Um, antennas must be above the tree line. That's not always correct. Uh, there are lots of uh, antennas that are using stealth. Um, stealth technologies where they could be as high as two, three feet above the sidewalk. Uh, you might see it on the corner of a building or on a rooftop or uh, on, a, on a church steeple or something like that. Um, higher is always better. That's not always the case as well. Uh, for some communications, you do want them actually down low uh, so that they have that, that they're connected closer to the actual handhelds. Uh, carriers do not always own the towers. Sometimes they do, but sometimes they lease, and again, that's where the speculators may get involved. Um, existing towers are grandfathered. That would be a misconception, um, provided that our ordinance <coughs> says it is. Uh, if an existing tower, if there's no changes to it, then we can just let it run as it is in perpetuity. But if an applicant has to, um, or a tower owner, needs to add something to it or modify it visibly or structurally in any way, we can require that that tower now come into, into compliance with our ordinance. Okay, now, so, in relation to the ordinance itself, um, what you're seeing here are just a, a, a uh, this would be a special use permit is what we'd be creating. Uh, the, the application would be reviewed by an outside professional engineering firm with, an, with a permit that is approved by the City Planning Commission. Uh, the Planning Commission is, consists of the Mayor, our Service Safety Director, and three citizens. Um, 
the cost for an application and for the review by the professional engineer would be an escrow account that is paid by the applicant. Um, that would be paid into the city, and then the city would reimburse the, um, you know, the professional engineer through the applicant paid escrow. Um, another point of this policy would be that it uh, promotes and encourages that co-location that I spoke about. It would encourage stealth technology so that we can minimize aesthetic and visual impacts. It will encourage leasing on city-owned lands when that's possible. <coughs> and it will discourage facilities from locating in residential districts. Uh, so this ordinance prioritizes where we want them. Uh, when we were at the Planning Commission, we had a pretty good discussion about should, they, should we even allow them at all in residential districts. Um, because of stealth technologies, I think that's certainly reasonable that we have them in residential districts as well. You know, if most of us here live in residential districts, and most of us also rely on our cell phones. So. We demand that coverage ourselves. Uh, emergency services at both the city, the county, and the state levels and federal levels are excluded from this policy. Uh, ham radio and private citizens bands are exempted. And facilities such as Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, uh, those would be exempted unless a tower is needed. And again, just to sum up, when, when I talked about stealth technologies, all of these that you see right here are stealth. Uh, that barn silo, that is a, that's a um, cell phone tower. You can see that nice rock on the bottom left-hand corner sitting in a nice in a public park. Um, that cactus right there, we probably wouldn't have a valid reason to put a cactus in Athens, but I suppose we could. Uh, our, the flag that you see there that's very similar to the one out on East State Street by the Holiday Inn Express, that's a cell phone tower. Um, then you can see that evergreen tree on the bottom right and the water tower there in the middle, top, so. That's it. Yes. I want to have a question for you real quick, and that is, uh, you mentioned insurance um, and how, building that in to where the provider, whoever owns the tower or erects the tower yes. would insure. Is that, uh, would that also mean then that any resident or a group of residents who live nearby would be um, not required to carry any extra insurance, i.e., hazard insurance, if they're in the fall zone. Of a that well, I'm not. I'm not comfortable answering that. I don't know, um, and I would defer to a homeowner's insurance agent. Mm -hmm. um, I would never recommend that an insurance policy that somebody not to drop any type of a policy um, on the reliance that anybody else has insurance. Um, but I, again, I really don't know other than that. The the insurance there is liability insurance. If you look at if you have a copy of the document, uh, it's on page 17, and that's section 36.23. Uh, we re require commercial general liability covering personal injuries, death, and property damage of one million dollars per occurrence or two million dollars in aggregate. Automobile coverage one million dollar per occurrence, two million dollars in aggregate. Uh, workers' compensation and disability would be at statutory amounts. Okay. The other thing I had is, uh, can we possibly get a stealth Passionworks flower to uh, be our intent? <laughs> <laughs> That'd be a great idea. That's a really good one. Uh, one, one thing that the ordinance as well, um, if you have a copy, 3625 um, was relating to fines. Uh, at the time I wrote it, um, I, it was a bit nebulous as to where the fines were or what they would be. Uh, as I researched several other city codes, including our city's floodplain ordinance, um, it occurred to me that uh, our standard our standard fine or penalty for non-compliance with a city code, it's a first-degree misdemeanor, repeatable on a daily basis. And I believe a first-degree misdemeanor is a thousand. Is that right? Thousand dollar fine on a daily basis. And so my recommendation would be for any fines or penalties for anybody not following this ordinance would be the same, that we have it as a first degree misdemeanor uh, repeatable on a daily basis. Okay. And that's something Planning Commission has open, left open for council input is fines and fees, to establish yeah. fines and fees in um, coordination with the administration. Because fees have to be set to the point where you can't make a profit 
on fees, and there are certain Ohio revised codes that govern fees. So that's something that we will be working with the administration to put into the ordinance, um, and such as daily fines, fees for application, bonds, I think are really important, how you deal with bonds and where they're placed. Um, and uh, I think that it's really important to have the takedown bond, where you, you know, yeah. sit down when it's no longer used, because we know many people have satellite dishes, you know, those are proliferating on many places where each individual rental unit has their new satellite, and it doesn't make sense for the satellite company to take it down, so we're gonna, it looks like NASA. My neighbor looks like NASA is around. So, um, other questions? Uh, I have a couple. Um, what about what would be the power ship to revoke the special permit? I suppose there's a tower that we just, the city decides, well, it, it just has to go. How do we get rid of it? Well, I think we'd have to have a good reason or we'd have to verify that it's, in, that it's not in compliance with city codes. Well, why would we even need a good reason? I mean, I'm, I'm just speculating here. That the city could say, well, it, for whatever reason, we don't like it. We want it removed. Can we do that? I think we have to have a reason, but yeah. It would have to be according. They're not upkeeping it. They're not providing um, the bonds. They refuse to pay the bonds. They're not paying insurance anymore. They're not providing lighting. They're not. It has to be for um, a reason according to the ordinance that we're talking about that you would revoke the license. You just can't say we don't like it anymore. It's not the right color and revoke it. So it has to be in accordance. Well, I mean, that's the process. Theoretically, you've gone through this process. We can, we can regulate the, you know, what Paul has gone through and this ordinance is regulating these sort of things. It will go through a public process because that's in the ordinance. And so hopefully, if um, the city has done the due diligence, we won't have these situations where we don't like it anymore and we want it down. I mean, city can't just 15 years from now say we don't like it. It has to be according to the code. So uh, otherwise, we just get our little behind sued. And the other question I had was um, uh, outdoor Wi-Fi antennas and things. Uh, uh, Wi-Fi is exempt unless it requires a tower. Well, that's my point. Uh, what would define a tower? I, I saw a lot of stealth there, and one was yeah. like, a, like a box under a rock, which looked very small. And I'm wondering, suppose I had that box on the side of my home. Would that require me then to get a permit? No, I don't believe so. I think this is for commercial purposes. Commercial. So, I mean, this would not necessarily require everybody who's getting satellite TV to get a permit, which personally I'd like everybody to get. See how they we just... Have that active hand, hand, hand radio group and right. Right. Mm -hmm. right. So this is commercial entities. Mm -hmm. and, and right. So... Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, I had a conversation, and I think I sent an email um, conversation with Paul earlier today, and that's on item 3612, the visibility of the facilities, and just uh, Paul had a good suggestion, Paul Logue did, and that was um, uh, where it talks about the lighting, if that's required. Um, to have it in effect as if it's uh, permissible under state and federal regulations, we'd like to insert the word local mm -hmm. and that it will place some stricter regulations on that for the lighting. Right. I would assume that this would fall under our lighting ordinance anyway. It would, yes. So that, That's why I suggested to Chris that we add that, right. the term, excuse me, Councilwoman Nisley, that we add the local <laughs> to it um, so that it, did, that it was clear that it now that required to follow the city's lighting ordinance. Right. So. Yeah. I, uh, I really like the, the, that you brought up the fact that a lot of these towers, uh, or a tower, would and could be multi-user um, and multi-user friendly. Um, the thing I would like to advocate for would be to almost kind of move that up a little bit in that 
if that it would be one of the first attempts if someone were to want to come in and build a tower that that be one of the things that is laid out first is is this tower a multi-use and this tower should be multi-use for for different vendors to come in and use that yeah I, as opposed to having, you know, a number of different people come in at different times saying, I'd like to build a tower. Next thing you know, we have multiple towers all over the city of Athens. Yeah. Um, as opposed to being proactive, it's almost like a Leeds version of a uh, environmentally friendly tower. I agree. Yeah. I believe the, the ordinance does require that any applicant, um, if, if there's existing towers, that the applicant must verify to the city that they, in good faith, approached other tower owners and try to negotiate in good faith for co-location and then they have to provide written documentation that, that that good faith request was denied and then they have to provide documentation as to why it was denied whether it was a situation of cost or something being unreasonable um, I was personally skeptical that co-location was um, something that was feasible and the more I started learning about it and I talked with several other communities and looked at other communities around Ohio and talk with a few people in the industry and they said when co-location is required it is the norm um, the because and if you eliminate the speculators from the equation then the tower the, the providers you know the your your cell phone providers their goal is not to build a tower they want to try to find the most inexpensive way to get that coverage to the community and so if they can find a way to lease or to build it on something that already exists that gets their height that they need, um, they're going to do it. So, um, but I will double check to confirm that co-location is, is a is a mandatory expectation for any new tower. Yeah. And again, and one of the benefits of this, because it's gone through the city's planning commission uh, as a special use permit, it is extremely transparent. Um, just like city council, planning commission meetings, or public agendas, they are broadcast on television, on the city's internet. Uh, we get good coverage from the media, and the public is invited to speak, and so the, the planning commission would be getting feedback from the community as well about those concerns. Uh, uh, just along with the co-localization, um, can we not only require new applicants to check existing towers, but can we require anyone that builds a tower to allow co-localization in the future? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, two issues that a public hearing is put in um, for a siting license through the Planning Commission. I don't necessarily need, I don't think we need it at the Council, but Planning Commission level. That is there that a public hearing, at some point, public meeting, public hearing about this permit is put in? Uh, on whatever the protocol at City Council would be. At the Planning Commission, um, we did not do a public hearing. We've been working on it off and on for over a year, though. No, I mean, when they when they apply for oh, the I'm permit. Oh, yes. I'm For the permit itself. Oh, yes, to, yes. In okay. fact, one thing I, I did forget to say is that there's um, one of the things that the Planning Commission would love, especially Mayor Weil, it mandates what's called a balloon test for any new tower, okay? So they the the applicant has to hang a balloon. Oh, that's great. If it's a 150 foot tower, they need to get a balloon that's visible from reasonable distances around the city, hold it at that distance, okay? And they need to publish that in the newspaper and the city will publish that, that this balloon is going to be hanging on these dates from this time and we require, I believe, two periods. Our goals are for one to be on a weekend and another to be on a weekday so that we try to get that blend of people that live in the city and people that are visiting the city or working in the city. Um, and then from that point, so we'll be, we'll be advertising that in our newspapers as well as just through word of mouth, that anybody can see that balloon. And if you can see the balloon, then you know that you're gonna be able to see a cell phone tower. Mm -hmm. um, and so then we can get that public comment back if people have concerns about how that balloon or how that tower may impact their aesthetics and their view shed, et cetera. Right. And the, the second comment, with co-use, um, where does um, city utilities, city emergency yeah. use comes into play? Well, yeah. my thought is that we're allowing these things in the city. We're permitting them. Um, we should have like some kind of rung on it, but we want to put some kind of emergency 
um, apparatus on it as our new radio, if we have a new radio frequency, that we can have some kind of access to these cell phone towers. Otherwise, you know, if we don't have access to them and we need some kind of new apparatus, we don't want to have to build one ourselves, so we should be included in the co-use agreements. Free. Free. I'll see if I'll... I think that... I'll, I'll look into seeing if we can do that. Sure. That's their public, their public, public duty. So. so you're meaning providing city access if we needed to put a, mm -hmm. a dish or some sort of right. instrumentation mm -hmm. on yes. the tower? Okay. So. Sounds reasonable to me. And I, I had one question. When you mentioned newspapers, there's this recent uh, situation in the legislature where they're trying to reduce the amount of public notice through newspapers. Does anybody know what I'm yeah, talking yeah, about? Yeah, yes. So I don't know when you write the ordinance. I, I am concerned about that mm -hmm. as a person in terms of uh, communicating with the uh, community about how they would know about the balloon hanging in the air on a weekend or during the week. I mean, there's always the website, but... Channel 5. I just want to throw that out there. You mentioned newsprint, and that may or may not exist sometime but in the future. I mean, to, in, my impression would be that if our ordinance says you've got to have public notice on a newspaper of record, then you've got to have public notice on a newspaper of record regardless. Now, if a newspaper of record no longer exists, as prints on a daily basis or a weekly basis, I guess we'd have to go back. No, I mean that they want to just take that out. Currently, you have to do public notice through newsprint. Yes. yes. And but this wouldn't be our public notice. This would be an applicant putting public notice that there, this is about to happen, okay. which I think would be a little bit different than the city placing public notice of a public meeting, I suppose. But. Mm -hmm. I'm not aware of that situation related I to I think that's at the state, state level. This, it, uh, this, it is at the state level, yeah. but I don't so know if that would. This would be more at the city level. So yes. again, that local influence or that local ordinance or following the local ordinances. I just want to kind of second um, what Member Fall was saying about having, you know, something written into where there is kind of a easement for public services to be able to mount something to, you know, not to get too far off track, but also put air quality monitoring equipment if needed up there. Um, or anything. Um, I like that idea a lot. Yeah. I think that's, that's wise. Thank you. I just wanted to briefly add that I appreciate your homework and efforts to get us to this point so far. It's obvious that you've done some research. Uh, I, I do want to acknowledge my gratitude and thanks, especially when we're looking at the health, safety, and the aesthetics of the community. So uh, that's simply all I had at this moment and look forward to reading more about this soon. Thanks. Thank you. It took a while. The Planning Commission was uh, instrumental in this. I would, uh, we started with something that our comprehensive plan recommended and realized that some of the language in that wasn't uh, very succinct and clear to what our what the possibilities were so we started building on that i would bring something to the planning commission they would say it's okay but let's keep looking at other ideas and other ordinances and see what other communities are doing and we played that back and forth for a good six to nine months until i kind of got exhausted with it but i was also very comfortable that we had something that was extremely airtight um, for our community, so. Thank you. Um, yeah, a lot of thanks as well to you and the Planning Commission, and um, <coughs> it's clear reading through this that, that there was a huge amount of effort that went into this, and, and it looks like a very solid ordinance. Um, looking at 3611, Section B, just to get a little specific here on something, this is in regards to the height of the towers, and I'm just sort of curious as to what the discussion was and what what that section B means there. Um, after reading it, it's not clear to me what, what that would require in terms of height. What that means, that's actually, um, and if somebody comes forward and says, okay, I need to build a tower and it needs to be 200 feet tall, okay, we require that a study be done to show that a tower at 190 feet is insufficient, okay? And if the study that says 190 feet is sufficient, 
we know that they're asking for something higher than is actually needed. And again, we have control to regulate based upon what's needed for our community. And so you, you can't get the people who just say, I want to build as high as possible and have this thing as garish as possible in our community. So that's one way to do it. Um, and then, so if we get it down to 190, then we can say, all right, well, let's, what happens at 180? And we can keep bringing it down and to find, and to, so we find that spot where, yeah. you know, and, uh, it, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, just keep in mind, um, the, the ordinance does have that mandated review requirement by a professional engineer. There are several engineering firms in, in this region. Um, that specialize in this type of a review, and they specialize in doing this type of review on behalf of communities to make sure that what's being approved is in the community's best interest. There are also engineers out there that will do these reviews on behalf of the applicant, and so we would be requiring this, and it would actually be the reviewer, the professional engineer who's reviewing on behalf of the city that could also tell us whether, you know, 200 feet's needed or 190 that quick so. And in regards to height, um, and this came up with the Roosevelt Tower uh, when, when we had to put that up, is my preference would be to not exceed the height that requires um, lighting up at the top of the tower at any residential location in the city. Um, and so you said that was 150 feet? That's what I'm thinking about. Um, when I was on Zona Board of Appeals, uh, the tower at Mount Cerro Village area mm -hmm. had to be a certain, and that was a cutoff at that time. Again, the other requirement is that it's a certain distance from an airport. And one of the discussions we had at that time actually is does the uh, hospital or Brennan's uh, heel pad constitute one? Uh, and again, the FAA could come along any day and say, this is, you know, realize if, if they, if, if pilots see it as a hazard, they could come along and say, we have to put one on regardless of height at, at one point. Okay. So there are conditions that actually, that's another standard route that could change. And again, most of these towers are really operating on line of sight issues, uh, so therefore that's why the height and the balloon for that matter. When we were doing our, our telephone system, that was one of the ways they checked it uh, in terms of catching everything. And there will always be some kind of shadow area with the rest of the type of hills we have here. Uh, and that's one of the dangers of why you get proliferation of towers on every hollow or ridge top, I should say. To reach all the nooks and crannies of the city. Yes. Any other questions? Uh, ju just one. Um, did you get much input, for, say, from the university or the county? We had the most input we received uh, was from uh, the local ham radio enthusiasts uh -huh. um, who really wanted to make sure that ham amateur radios were exempted. Uh, we had a good discussion about that. Um, the there is language at the federal level and there's actually language going through at the state level right now to ensure that ham radios are exempted from these types of ordinances but at the federal level it's, it's required that if you have an amateur radio or a ham radio call number or whatever the, the term would be um, that you are part of our civil defense system uh, and so it's important that we have ham radios out there um, they, they provide a service that most of us probably wouldn't even realize uh, they're, the, they're going to be operating and communicating when everything else goes down. Uh, so we thought we thought it was important that they be exempt from this. Um, we received some support from our um, Athens County Hazard Mitigation Committee uh, in relation to that as well. Uh, our initial, our, my initial ordinance was silent on uh, whether safety agencies outside of the city, such as sheriffs and emergency 911, um, or anybody at the state or federal level, whether they were exempt from this, and it was brought to my attention that it's, you know, we do have a sheriff's office in, within the city limits, and if they have communication needs, we should be cognizant of that. Um, other than that, we didn't receive uh, very much comment. Um, but there were several people that provided some feedback um, that they were encouraged by the direction of this. So, I also discussed it with Terry uh, Wyatt during the uh, city meetings, and uh, they're indeed willing to comply uh, because they, of course, have the same kind of pressures coming to them mm -hmm. in terms of tower yeah. erections. So, and if you're doing it on a for profit basis, if you're building a tower um, for our phones or something like that, uh, being building it on Ohio University Cross. 
land would not exempt you from this ordinance because the university may be exempt if it has to do with the institutions of higher learning, but if the university is doing something on a leasehold or for-profit basis, then they would have to be in compliance with our ordinance, too. I had one last thing that you just reminded me of. Thinking about university buildings, several buildings in the uptown area have towers that have been constructed on top of them within the past five or six years. And I didn't examine the text close enough yet on this. Does this address rooftop installations? Rooftops are an option for stealth capabilities. Or you could make up the height. You know, if you need to do 100 feet but you've got 55 feet of rooftop, yeah, you could apply and do it like that. We would still have to do the same review process. I wanted to make sure it would still go through the review process. There is a hierarchy of how we want to see these things in place and in what zones, with our R1 zones being our least favorite place for them, our manufacturing zones being the most preferred. We did recommend that any historic districts that are registered districts, also we are discouraging that as far as tower facilities. We would be encouraging anything stealth, though, for the same reason, because there is a need. You know, these aren't. There's a real need for these for our everyday lives. Thank you. I'm just thinking about this now with the rooftop towers and things like that. I think you mentioned this, and this I understand as well, but optimally we're really talking about regions around the city that are going to be optimal would be 7, 8, 900 foot elevation levels, you know, not down the floodplain because you're talking optimal span. And if optimal span is reaching a high point, which could be right outside the city limits, then that would be the optimal region in which to put these towers as well. Is that quite possible? Correct. Yeah. We're not necessarily talking about plopping something right in the middle of Athens City. It could be. I actually had a request for it in 2010 and then a resubmittal of the request for consideration for use for on-city property in the West End. So it's definitely coming. Okay. So it behooves us to pass this expeditiously. Yes. Thank you. 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 Thank